What up, fam? Welcome back to Entrepreneur Hour podcast and Entrepreneur Hour TV, where we create superhuman entrepreneurs. I've got a, we're going to talk about something that I think is really fundamentally important. And we've had a lot of guests on talking about different views and perspectives and what have you. I've had libertarian candidates on the show. I had Larry Sharp, the, the libertarian candidate I'm talking about. We've had democratic candidates. Today, we're going to have a, a, a viewpoint from a different perspective through a different lens. And I think that's important. We're going to talk about why, because today we're going to talk about cancel culture and what I feel to be such a big threat to our society, to our democracy, to our republic. And so joining me today is somebody that I follow online and I really respect the work that he does and also the thousands and thousands of conversations that he has around the country, in different cultures within different demographics and peoples. So Will Witt of PragerU, welcome to the show, man. How are you? Good, man. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Dude, before, before we get started, man, happy almost birthday, bro. I saw you got one coming up. I know. Well, Prager, you post this thing. My birthday's on Saturday. You post this thing so early. I'm yeah. like, why didn't you wait till Saturday to post it? And now I got all these people messaging me happy birthday. And I'm like, you better well, save that same energy for when it's actually your birthday. <laughs> you're a young cub, right? You're, you're what, 22? 20, I'll be 24. You'll be 24. Yeah, man. so I'm pretty young. Good on you, dude, to be so active and engaged and involved. 24, I was... God knows what bar I was bouncing into or what I was doing. <laughs> not to say you're not enjoying yourself, but I, I, I appreciate the, the focus and the, the maturity in, in what you're doing. So, Thank uh, you. But for those who don't know you, they may not follow Prager you or, or you yourself. Uh, just give us a quick, because we have a lot we want to talk, let's talk about today. So give us the quick 30 second, who are you, what you do? Yeah, so I'll start. PragerU is a digital marketing, or not digital marketing, a di digital video company. We put out short five-minute videos on a variety of topics. Also have a ton of other shows. Some of those shows include me. Some are other great presenters like Candace Owens, things like that. Uh, I have a podcast, Will Wit Live, which I do once a week. And basically, I started out in Colorado, dropped out of college to actually go work for PragerU. I was never a conservative basically my whole life until I mm. went to college. And I was like, wow these people are crazy. <laughs> and it turned out that a lot of the common sense values that I had just growing up that were instilled on me from my mom were actually conservative values. They aligned with a political party, really. Yeah. And so I became super involved and made a video, sent it to PragerU. They loved it. Eventually offered me a job, dropped out of school to come work for PragerU in Los Angeles. Interesting. So when you start to make that, it's crazy, man. I say this all the time, but it's like, now it's like, you have to be courageous to say you're conservative. And it's like, dude, what, what? Like I even, I even said to a friend of mine who's in your neck of the woods, a little bit further North. Um, and, and I said, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm sharing my conservative values online. And he's like, yeah, you, you might want to reconsider that term. And I'm like, I'm not going to reconsider that term. I'm a conservative. That's ridiculous. So when you were kind of coming out of the conservative closet, so to speak, what, what was some of the pushback that you got? What was some of the, you know, we we're going to talk about cancel culture. Did you start to experience that? when you're making that transition yourself or starting to explore those elements of your values and beliefs? Oh, I definitely experienced, I mean, I experienced all the trying to cancel me. Um, I mean, but there's, there's a difference though, because I was never someone, I mean, this is why I do what I do now. And I think why I've been so successful as well as Prager you is that I was never someone to come and complain and say, Oh, it's so hard for me as a conservative to speak out. And I'm, I'm so scared of losing everything and all this. It's like when I started going down this path and making my life, what I wanted to be and having this career, I mean, I went full speed ahead 110%. When I was in my sociology classes, my political science classes, everyone knew that I was that, that, Republican kid who supported the president and would raise his hand and talk back about mm -hmm. every single leftist thing they brought up. And I won too. And I would have kids in my class. They'd come up to me afterwards and they'd say, Hey man, like, I love what you said in there, but you know, I'm too scared to say what mm. I, what I wanted to say. And, and, uh, we should be friends. I'm like, no, like you should be standing up too. I can't do this all by myself. You being a conservative and being too weak to actually do something is the reason why our country is the way that it is right now. California is the way that it is because conservatives and Republicans are too weak to actually stand up and get anything done. I know that was kind of tangent of the, the answer I was getting, but yeah, I, I definitely experienced those kind of things, but I always push back in the face of it. And I got a lot more than, and still do a lot more than, you know, a lot of other people still. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure now specifically, it, things are pretty pretty tough. Um, but let me ask you this, man. I think this is important because I think, again, a reference how my friend said you might want to reconsider a new term, which obviously I'm not going to do. Uh, but what was it specifically, right? Let's identify what conservatism means to you and, and kind of what were the guiding foundational principles that said this is appealing to me 
this is why I align myself with that. It, it, maybe it was one thing or maybe it was like a, a plethora of different things. I don't want to kind of limit it, your, your thought process here, but what was the one thing you're like, man, that really appeals to me and I understand the, the value behind this and the merit behind this. The thing with conservatism that I like the best is that it's the, the ability to, to be free from intervention from other people, right? So you have the mm. ability to, to live out your dreams in whatever way possible that is, you know, in a way that's not hurting anyone else. And leftism is the opposite of that. It is about control. It is about uh, power, where conservatism basically says, here you have the tools and the abilities now living in a country where conservatism is, where you can start a business, you can start a family, you can do all these things you want without interference from some other party. And leftism is the complete opposite of that. And so for me, being someone, you know, again, who dropped out of college, who came and worked for PragerU, moved to a whole different city, it's like, I want to be able to have the freedom to be able to do that, to be able to speak my mind and put these things out there. Without those kind of freedoms, I could never have had the job that I have now, you know, with the left, right. with things like hate speech and censorship and things. It, it'd be very difficult if they had their way. So conservatism is definitely the, the way for me. And I think the best way to have a free and, and successful society. Yeah, I, I obviously agree. Power the individual, right? Empower a person. Um, not not necessarily enable per se or, or 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 treat them like they're less than or inferior or incapable of achieving if anything that anybody else has achieved right and and you know I, I talk about this often but my wife is from Puerto Rico she moved here when she was 21 right so nine ten years ago she now is a multi-million dollar company English is not her first language and technically she's you know uh, Puerto Rico is a part of the U.S. but we treat it like the redhead stepchild right like it's it's not a state we don't treat it as a state it kind of is but it isn't right um, and then her brother comes here and he builds a, a multiple six figure business when, within a matter of 18. Like, it's just, it's unbelievable to me. Anybody can do this. Like anybody can go have success if they actually believe in the power of themselves, of individualism, right? So I, I completely believe that. So let me ask you this then, why is that worth canceling? Where did this cancel nonsense come from? Because what you just said, that to me is is something worth rallying around and something to really preach and teach to people and have people buy into that right? Where did the canceling come into this equation? So if you're familiar with Nietzsche, who was a, you know, 18th century German philosopher, he had the famous phrase that said, God is dead. We have killed him. If you're, mm. if you're familiar with this at all, but he wasn't saying this as like a congratulatory thing. Like, yes, God is dead. Finally, you know, now we can have something else. It was a, it was a scary thing for him because now in the West, we were losing a system of morality or a system of beliefs that, that people could abide by. Right. And so people still look for meaning in their lives, even without God and uh, Judeo Christian values. And so as America and the West becomes more and more secular, people still need to find some sort of meaning in their lives. And so they do that with leftism. They do that with something like climate change or this racism stuff all going on now or any other movement that, that goes with leftism. This becomes the meaning in their lives. So now when you have someone who goes against that and they say, you know, I am against your religion, essentially, mm. then they turn into people who want to completely shame you, first of all, out of envy, and second of all, because you are, you are destroying their, their belief system. You know, that's a very personal thing to them. So when right. you're coming and saying, you know, I, I don't agree with you, with what you've kind of based your whole life about, which, you, which gives your life meaning, then of course, people want to cancel you for that. They want to bring you down and shut you down. There is no, there is no uh, appeasing these people when they've made this entire thing, their religion and their moral code. Is that the main thing? And obviously I referenced when we got started here that you've had conversations with thousands of people. Is that the main hurdle for people to, to overcome is the because we talk about conservatism in the, in the power of an individual right and, and from a secular standpoint like removing faith from that equation which conservatism and faith in terms of judeo-christian values have kind of come synonymous right and, and rightfully so uh, is that the big point of emphasis is not the focus on the individual but the focus necessarily on the the judeo-christian values as it relates to maybe some of the things that they push for, which is diversity, LGBTQ, et cetera, et cetera, you know, the gender, things in that nature. I think it's that they push, we push for the power of the individual. They push for the power of the herd. So they are very powerful when they are all together trying to bring someone down. You know, you look at people who are incredibly successful and they're either wealthy or they have a lot of clout or they do something very influential. And then you have this herd of people, this mob of people, which we call the mob, you know, the Twitter mob coming and sure. canceling people sure. who try and take them down. And it's, it's, it's out of envy. It is out of trying to shame mm. people. It is because they know that they can all get together. These are mediocre people. If you're in a part of a Twitter mob attacking someone, you are a mediocre or 
loser person. And they get together a bunch of losers to bring down someone successful because they don't want to see someone be better than them. And that is what leftism is about. It is about the envy. It is about the control. It is about the, sh the shame. Whereas a religion like Christianity is, is, is completely about love. If someone disagrees with your religion when it's Christianity, at least that's how it was for me. Because, you know, I, I was an atheist my entire life. And then I became a Christian. And it's like know that. the entire time I was an atheist, it's like Christians were so nice to me. They, they were never like, you stupid atheist, I hate you. Mm. They were like, we want to bring you in. Like, we love you too. And like, we'll wait for you. And then I eventually did. And they were the most loving people I've ever met, you know, but that is different than the, the religion of leftism, which is all about shame. It is all about a, a herd mentality and bringing people down who are more successful than you because you screwed up your life. But this, but here's the thing, Will, this isn't a new point of, 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 an inflection point, right? Like this is, this is something that has fundamentally been true for years, as far back as I can remember, right? As far back as me being a, being a kid, right? The difference that I see is that you could put a sign in your yard that said, and this happened in my neighborhood. Maybe you've experienced something like this yourself where, you know, my family tended to, to lean right. I would say more moderately, right. And our neighbors leaned moderately left and they would put up their whatever blue sign and we put up our red sign, right? And we joked about it as neighbors, like it's no, it's no big deal, right? And we knew that they didn't have Christian values and that we did. It was fine, it wasn't a big deal, it wasn't a big issue. So I guess as part of this cancel culture and what I wanted to get from you, and obviously I appreciate the Genesis point of like looking back through the, the you know, kind of the lens through history, but when did we cross the line and why of it becoming so extreme that we are operating in these mobs like you described, these Twitter mobs of mediocre people, of just trying to tear down other people and jealousy and when did it just not become okay to disagree, to have different viewpoints and that be all right? That's a part of a healthy society. I think that social media is probably the main cause of it. As well as um, going with it. Yeah. I, I mean, the way that the algorithms work, this isn't a leftist or even conservative thing. If you're a leftist and you are on social media and you're on Facebook and you like a CNN article, then the left is going to continue to, or Facebook is going to continue to push you with leftist articles, leftist videos, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And if you're conservative, you like a Fox News thing, you're going to keep getting pushed with these things. So you're never seeing a different point of view unless you are searching it out yourself because these people want to keep you on the app. So then when mm. you find someone who has a different point of view than you, it's like there is no coming together. And I mean, you know, with my following and things i post you know on facebook like i don't know like six times a day we schedule out the posts and it's like sometimes i'll go through and i'll read the comments I and it's like scary and it's people on there all day long yeah. i don't know how they do it arguing back and forth on social media never getting anywhere and that stuff it weirds me out yeah it weirds me out that people are willing to spend their time on social media arguing with someone who they don't who they never even met before i know like, to me it seems like a whole with social media and going in on that, I mean, it's a whole insecurity thing where you feel like you have to prove yourself to someone on social media who you've never even met. They might not even have a real profile picture of themselves and you have to yeah. go in there and like prove yourself right. It, it, it's really strange to me. And I think social media is the root cause of it. I think I, man, I totally agree with you. I, I, Jordan Peterson was talking about this and he was saying that it, it's hard for us to, and this is my work, not his verbatim, but basically it's hard for us to live in a three-dimensional world but treat something as two-dimensional like social media, like the internet, right? So we read all these comments from people we've never met, but we can't not take it personally as though it's someone that's making an attack against us personally, an actual ad hom attack against us, right? So I think you have tribalism, which you mentioned, and then further indoctrination on social media. And then I was actually just reading, I'm reading a great book, which I recommend to people called Influence by Robert, Dr. Robert Cialdini, and he talks about pluralistic ignorance, where it's basically you might feel something's wrong, right? But if you see that everyone's going along with it, then you kind of fall in line anyways. And they liken it to somebody that like, I think there was a woman in, in New York that was stabbed, you know, years ago, like decades ago, was stabbed something like 30 something times. And all these people were, were seeing it happen over the course of like an hour. And nobody called the police because they just assumed that someone else had. So everybody just kind of was a, was a, was a you know, a bystander that didn't act. Right. And they said the likelihood that you as an individual would have done it if no one had seen. Right. If you were by yourself and you saw this person getting stabbed, the percentage that you would actually call the police is far higher than if you were in a group. So I think going through these comments and seeing things just confirms your own bias. And I think the cognitive dissonance that's required for you to break that pattern to consider another perspective becomes you become so indoctrinated that you just you can't break free. It's ideological possession. So it's scary, man. So anyway, sorry for my my little diatribe there. But. What do we do with social media then? Because it is so powerful to convey a message. Like you've been able to reach people in ways that are very, very powerful. So how do we use this tool in a positive manner, right? That's a peaceful manner. Is it just a matter of 
culturally and societally, we have to get used to this new modality, this new medium that we've never had before? What, how do we reconcile this and make it a peaceful application in our lives? Right. It's definitely a double-edged sword, you know, I mean, because PragerU with everything we've done, I mean, 500 million views on my videos alone and 4 billion on PragerU videos. I mean, that's because of social media and being able to reach people and change minds and all that, you know, but then all the adverse consequences of that are obviously pretty terrible with all the other things going on in social media. You know, I wish I had a better answer for your question of how to fix it, but I really don't know. I mean, it's something that people are so addicted to. I mean, they're addicted to it just like any other drug. They go on it all day, again, arguing with people, looking at things, confirmation bias. It happens all day, every day. I mean, I don't know what we're supposed to do except find a way that I think there needs to be the the main thing that I would say is that parents need to be more responsible for their children. Mm. I mean, we have these parents who give their kid an iPhone or give their kid an iPad and sit them down and let them stay on there all day. They're on TikTok, they're on Snapchat, Twitter, just looking at these things all day. And so they're becoming addicted from a very early age. You know, I find that like children who aren't being treated like that by their parents are much happier children and are probably going to be much more successful in the long run versus parents who just let their kids just sit on social media all day or on their phones all day. I think there's a lot of uh, responsibility that needs to be placed on the parents actually. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, and I would actually say to take that a step further, even putting limits on yourself as far as, you know, I, I have a, you know, an iPhone, so I'll do like screen time where I, I limit myself to certain social media and I've been trying to stay out of comments just because I, I need to be mindful of my own, you know, cognitive bi- or, or confirmation bias and, you know, things of that nature. So I, I would, I would totally agree. Do, do you think that, and this is kind of a, you know, you and I talked before I hit the record button. Do you think that this is, we're at a point where this is irreparable, right? Are we at a point of irreconcilable differences? And it's like you, meaning, you know, the left side of the aisle versus you, right? So we're just going to separate and go out and you're going to take these states. We take, I mean, that's pretty extreme measures, right? I, I feel like, and maybe other people don't see it this way, but the, I don't think we've ever been this divided and we've ever been this unwilling to have discussion. And and my, dude, my thing is this, and I'm an entrepreneur, right? So I, this crushes me to my soul because I'm a pragmatist. I see problems, I fix problems. That's the essence of an entrepreneur. So for me, friction of ideas is where you arrive at innovative solutions, right? And without that, you're just stagnant. If it's just total groupthink and monolithic, you don't get anywhere, right? Because nobody's willing to take a chance to say something that goes against the grain, so to speak. So are we at that point, Will, of irreconcilable differences? Is Or what can we do to start coming back? Is it, a, is it an uprising of moderates of saying, okay, guys, this is enough. We're getting back to the basics here. We're getting back. Like, what can we do? Are we too far gone? And what can we do to kind of get back to to center here? Well, it's almost impossible to be a moderate now. If you're a moderate, you get, you basically get tossed out. Exactly. You have to choose a side. You have to be strong on one. But I mean, this might seem a little weird, but going and talking about the social media stuff that we were just talking about, these companies have so much power that it continues to divide us and divide us and divide us. Right now, you look at the top companies in the US, the biggest companies, they are doing exponentially well. They're growing, the largest companies in the world continue to grow while small businesses in this country during this pandemic and this lockdown Mm -hmm. are suffering. They are, 30% of them are are never going to open again. I mean, their sales are all going down, but these big tech companies are doing so well and doing fine. So they're profiting off us doing terribly and becoming more divided. I think that there needs to be something put in place where the country needs to be able to have more free markets and a better ability for people to start businesses without so many restrictions. If people can do that, then I think people are going to be less worried about the actual political day-to-day of things going on. Because right. if they're able to, to go to their own vi- devices and, and start a business or, or be able to just live their life how they want to, then they don't need to go on social media all day and battle against people. There's nothing to battle against. People need more freedom to be able to get away from these these tribal political ideologies so we have the right being you know very even the right you know it's being very upset about things battling with the left all day the left battling with the right all day if people are able to do what they want they yeah. won't be battling nearly as much so, so you, you say that and i comp- I'm, I'm i'm in complete agreement here with this here's the problem the way i see it well i i, I kind of painted a, a pretty fatalistic picture of like you know i think we're at a point of irreconcilable differences where we go one fundamental direction or we go another i i truthfully believe that i think we're at that point so now we're also telling people okay you need to stay off social media and you need to live your life and do this and that i think the the, the conflict the internal conflict that people feel is that they inherently 
and, and innately know what I just said, that, man, I'm scared about this radicalization. I'm scared about a lot of the extremism that I'm seeing. I've got to do something, but I don't know what that looks like. So I'm on social media and I'm fighting, right? And, and, and I myself, if I'm being quite candid, I don't even know entirely what to do. So I reached out, I was like, well, I'll have Will on my show and we'll talk about it and we'll use my audience and we'll, we'll leverage that and maybe that'll help. Re so even I myself don't really know what I can do. So for people that are business owners specifically, because that's what we want to talk about. Business owners are deeply affected by what's going on, some of which in extreme cases, their business are being burned to the ground. Even us, like, you know, part of what we do is an online business. Man, COVID, our numbers were fine. F George Floyd and beyond, numbers tanked man like people are just staying off of social media because they're doing what you said and that's how we advertise ourselves so what can people do if the answer is not social media if the answer is not i know you said empower people to start businesses and so on and so forth but in terms of activism in terms of making their voice be heard what can they do they're scared about going outside they're scared i mean we hear about people like the trump supporter that got shot in portland right like if you go outside even wearing an american flag shirt right now you're probably going to get maybe some judgment or am i over exaggerating this like what can you do to actually let your voice be heard and to counteract some of the stuff that's going on in the world as you see it. Well, you will definitely get judgment, but what are you going to do? Sit around and be weak for the rest of your life? You have yeah. to stand up for the things you believe in if that's what you believe in. You know, otherwise, again, like I said right at the beginning of this, it continues to get worse because conservatives are too weak. I have a shirt on right now. It says, I don't know if this is video too, but yeah. they can. it says former fetus on it. And yeah. I'm walking around here in Hollywood. With, oh my God, you're fucking that says killed. That. Exactly, you know, and it's like, but I, I'm not scared of those kind of things. When I went on a plane just a little while ago, I had an NYPD officer uh, hoodie on and the black flight attendant came up to me and asked if I was going to pop off on her because I was wearing a, a thing with a police, supporting the police on it. I mean, of course, people are going to say things to you, but that's just how it goes, okay? That's how it goes. I'm sure that if you went to to you know some very red state and or some place in iowa and you wore a, a very left-wing t-shirt they wouldn't like you very much either that's just how it is with the culture most urban cities and big places in america that culture is there you can never apologize to these people stand up for what you believe in and the main thing you can do is actually have conversations with people if you that's if if people actually talk to each other like think about how many conservatives there are like just the people who follow me like 250,000 whatever people if every single one of those changed the minds of someone yes. else I mean yes. that's that's hundreds of thousands of people it's yeah. all about just talking to one person stop wasting your time on some useless social media argument that goes nowhere and actually try and change the mind of someone who you care about or you're close to it'll do way more good and just be way more successful for actually helping this country I was hoping you're gonna say that will because that's exactly where I'm at is like and, and I, I was talking to my mentor and he's like all we have to focus on is the one to three percent because if you focus on just you know move, shifting at one to three percent meaning collectively you know, we just have to play our part in that and have those conversations and there's people out there that like you right that are that are fighting for that for free speech and I, and I I'm in total agreement with you we can't we can't sit behind and say yay Ben Shapiro and then like oh when it comes to social situations I'm not gonna I'm not gonna wear my shirt because I'm too afraid like we have to stand up too and and we actively support groups right now I, I'm I'm totally against this this slam on free speech I had a guy yesterday that said that said he was gonna unfollow me because I'm, I inject too much religion in my tweets and that I liked a few Trump tweets. Dude, what if I had put, let's, let's just play, let's just play role reversal here. Let's say that my religious tweets was happened to be Christian, you know, Christianity leaning tweets. Let's say they were another religion and you had said that to me. I mean, outrage, right? Complete outrage. So it's just ridiculous. So I'm really, that's my focus is I'm fighting for that. I'm fighting all, because I think that's a point that a lot of people will agree with. Like that's fundamentally wrong. Regardless of where you are, that's wrong. So I think starting with that, having conversations, things that you care about with the people that are close to you that actually listen to you. Now, the one thing I will ask you this is when in person do you know somebody's ready to listen and when in person, because you would know better than anybody, this is what you do. When is somebody ready to listen you can tell versus when is somebody just, it's not their, it's not their time right now, right? There's not part of their journey where they're ready to be open to new ideas and thoughts. Well, you can always make someone open if you let them do the talking. It's like it's like saying someone's name, you know, people love their own name like thousand times more than they love anyone else's name. If people have the ability to express what they believe, they'll talk about their opinions 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Right. So the way that I do it, if you guys have seen my videos on Prager.com, I mean, the way I do it is I'm asking them questions so that they have to explain their rationale back to me. I'm yes. not going up to them and saying climate change is a myth. And here's why I say, why do you believe climate change is is really happening right now then they have to explain it 
And then when you continue to guide the questions, it takes practice. Don't expect to get this just on the first time being really good at this. I've been doing this for a while, so I've gotten a lot better at it. But you, they have to change their minds themselves. It's not necessarily even you doing it. I mean, I leave conversations with people where I've completely changed their minds on things and they don't even know that I'm a conservative after the conversation is mm. over because they're the ones who've had to do this whole thing in their own minds, right? Some random guy on the street who's talking to him isn't going to be the one to say like, oh, here's the newest, here's how you should live your life philosophy. It's like they do it themselves just by how I ask them. So that's the way to do it, is by asking them questions, leading the conversation so that they have to actually get the, the wheels turning inside their own head. Brene Brown calls that tactical empathy. And that's one of the things that I noticed that you do extraordinarily well. And I'm not just saying that because you're right here in front of me. Uh, I think that, you know, as someone who, who also does what you do, which is interview people, and I talk, you listen way better than I do, I talk too much. Um, but... You do a great job of a leaning into asking questions with genuine curiosity, not because you're looking to um, to to rebuke what they said, right? Some people ask questions just so they can just dominate the conversation and insert their own thoughts, right? I can tell you lean in with actual genuine curiosity of what they stand for and why they stand for it. But also the other thing too is I've noticed that you have a very calm, cool, collected demeanor, which is just dude, you're cool, will right? That's just how you roll. So that that I think that really works to your benefit as well. It's not this like overpowering, uh, domineering presence that you provide. And I think it allows for people to kind of maybe open up to you more than other people would. So those two things, if people are looking to have real conversations in the real world, I think you've provided a phenomenal example for how to do that effectively. Thank you, man. I feel like these people's therapists sometimes I'm out there talking yeah. to them, helping them out. But it's like, I'll just say this, it's like, there's there are other people who do man on the street videos or interviews with people who are conservative, right? I'm not, not the only one, obviously, but the way that I make my videos is that I'm not just making videos for conservatives. I'm making videos for everyone. I want people yes. on the left or people in the middle or people who haven't even heard about politics before to watch my videos and say, wow, like this guy actually like explained it really well. Or like I saw how this person's mind changed in the video. Maybe they were actually right, you know, versus just making some video that says, ha ha, libtard, you're an idiot leftist. You know what I mean? Like people yeah. make those videos and a lot of them, some of them can still be funny, but it's like that's never been my thing that I've wanted to do, changing minds has always been paramount. And I think that's why, you know, after three years of doing this, I've still continued to grow and remain successful while, while a lot of the other people have, have not. So there's my advice to people that when you are doing this, I mean, it is important to, to have changing minds and actually helping people at the forefront of what you're doing, not just trying to, to showcase stupidity or expose people. Yeah, uh, we got to let you go because we're completely out of time. But I wanted to ask you real quick before we do, um, and I'll let you tell people where to follow you and stuff like that if they're not doing so already. What would you say has been the most rewarding aspect of the work you do? Maybe a specific example or specific conversation. I've seen several where I could tell after the recording, you're like, that was awesome, right? Like you get genuine pleasure out of it, which is cool. Uh, but what has been the most rewarding part of being out in the real world, right? Not just social media, but in the real world, having real conversations, what's been the most rewarding part for you? I'll say one that I haven't actually said before, but I've just been recently thinking about it. I was giving a speech in Texas before COVID stuff. And if you guys know anything about my story, I grew up without my father around. And so I was giving this speech about pro-American values and everything. It was on the border state. And this woman, she raised her hand after the speech was over. She was a single mom taking care of her son. And it was a lot like my story. And she told me that, you know, if when her son grows up, she wants him to be just like me. And uh -huh. it was like, you know, I know that's a little maybe more personal than something you might have been looking for, but just no, that was, exactly I mean, that was like, yeah. that's an amazing thing that people see me as a role model being 24 years old now and, and being a role model for so many people. Just, I, I don't even know how to quantify it, man. It's like, it changed my life and just makes me want to be the best person possible. The most godly person, like everything and just really, really help people. Yeah. Yeah. Well, dude, I, I, I commend you guys, you're on the front line, you're doing a lot of work and, and you, guys, you guys have inspired people like myself that have largely ignored politics most of my life. Just knowing the hoopla and the games and the nonsense and how they just try to emotionally get you engaged and involved when it's just like, dude, I know this is just Washington, leave me alone, I'm just trying to live my life. But you guys have, have done a good job of showing the way and, and, and you're making a big difference. You really, really are. You're making a big cultural difference and you're making it okay to disagree again, right? And that's fantastic, man. That's what we need in this country. So I commend you guys. I know you don't need it from me or from anybody else, but you really, for your age, not just in general, but for your age specifically, man, I really admire you guys like Charlie Kirk, Candace Owens, you yourself, Ben Shapiro. I mean, 
there's a plethora of you that are out there really doing good work. And I see it as a great awakening. I really do. And so I think when, when history is, is all said and done, I think it, it will reflect that you guys were doing really positive work in the world, man. So I commend you. It was an honor to have you on the show. Uh, please let everybody know where they can go to follow you before we let you leave. Thank you so much, man. My social media is at the Will Wit. So kind of a, a, a weird name, but the Will Wit. That's on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, everything. Go follow me there. And then you can watch all my videos as well on PrayGuru.com. Awesome. Thanks, brother. I enjoy the conversation, man. Thank you for having me. Talk to you later, man. <laughs>